Hello friends, my name is Rachel Janus, middle girl from Sullivan's middle name, well, my as well last name. I'm here on behalf of the theatre to discuss the magic of the Golden Sullivan offers by very pedantically making every element of them. Let me tell you about the last two weeks of my life. So, on the 4th of May, I visited Heber Castle to check it out. Link below in the description for gondoliers tickets. There's one... It'll be tomorrow when I release this video. It'll be tomorrow. So you should check that out. <laughs> so I was visiting Heber Castle and then the next day I started to feel unwell. And as it transpires, I'd caught COVID at a rehearsal on the Wednesday night because some other people who are at that rehearsal caught COVID. And I was sick for a week with COVID. It was, it was so bad. Like I didn't have a fever. That was the weird thing. I didn't, I, I didn't have a fever and I wasn't coughing, but I just felt so dizzy whenever I stood up and I just couldn't really do anything. I just had to lie down. I couldn't even edit. I thought of filming a video, but I knew it was just going to be nonsense. So I didn't try. And then because I, I don't have a job that's salaried, I just work in a shop. So if I don't go in, I don't get paid. So I then this week had to work pretty much every day, not just in the shop. I also worked in a couple of other places too, but I, this is my ninth day. No, my eighth day in a row working. And I also have a rehearsal all day tomorrow and then I'm working all day the day after that. So at the moment I'm really tired and I'm just going to admit that to you right now. I still think this video is going to be good. The reason it's going to be good is because I scored this ages ago, like three weeks ago. And I'm only just now doing it. I was meant to do it, like, you know, when I was sick. And that's why I had to release the quartet video early because that was the only thing I even had vaguely ready and that, but I guess I was just too sick to film this one. But I'm now ready to film it, but it does mean that I've been thinking over and like mulling over these scores and this list for three weeks. So I'm really happy with the way that this list turned out and I hope you guys all agree. So let me go over the parameters. As ever, there's a mark out of 20 for music and there is a mark out of 20 for lyrics. There is a mark out of 20 for emotional slash comedic stakes. And I think I'm vaguely sticking to that rule that something can only get 19 or 20 if it is vaguely both of those things. Like if it was just funny or just really emotional, I, I feel like it can't really get the full box. I know that people in my quartet video disagree with that, but I think that's fair, you know? I don't know, let's let, let see. I'm not drunk, I don't even drink, so if I seem drunk, I'm not, I'm, I'm just tired. Narrative, character, importance, I gave a mark out of 10, and enjoyment, I gave a mark out of 10. And we have 14 items on this list, and some of, a couple of them, probably wouldn't be described as arias, but I've included them anyway because I didn't know where else to put them. Something interesting about this list actually is that all of the scores, I mean I did do a little bit of tinkering to try and break ties, but I have an item in this list from almost every number between 49 and 61. Like I have pretty much one in in every in every number, and then there's a jump to sixty four sixty five and then number one got seventy one points so I have a clear winner and then a clear second third place, even though they did switch places a couple of times, but then everything else just pretty much fell in order when I was sick, what I did was I listened to them in ascending order from you know worst to best and I thought about it a great deal and I really think that I've got this list of bass arias down which is something I'm proud of because I'm not a bass I don't know much about basses and also I don't cons this isn't like a particularly strong list I think even though it's got some really great stuff on it none of these songs apart from maybe one have like true iconic status I think 
but most of them are just songs that wouldn't be people's favourite songs, but they're still good numbers and they are GNS songs and I like GNS, so I like them and that. Now, with that in mind, let's get started. At number 14, we have from Iolanthe, When All Night Long A Chap Remains. And I'm aware that, oh, my ring light just stopped working. That was weird. Did you guys see that? I'm sure you did. There we go. Don't think it makes much difference because the light is still on outside. And by the light, I mean the sun, but not for too much longer. I'm filming, I'm literally filming on the evening of uploading my New York adventure video. Like, literally, it's the same evening. I had no time! Anyway, when all that long a chat remains, I'm aware that in the quartet video, we were doing a lot of talking about, <laughs> so perhaps I may incur your blame, and I remember in the Baritone Arias video that when Britain Really Ruled the Waves also didn't do that well. And these all three songs are songs that I don't really find that interesting. But I just really want to stress that I do absolutely love Iolanthe. It just seems to be coincidental that we've talked about some quite weak songs in Iolanthe so far. However, My Lord of Suppliant, that came second to my Mezzo Arias. And some people probably think it should have come first. I just have this fetish for Mad Margaret. But I absolutely love that aria. But... Iolanthe is one of the most charming, most loved operas, but this is not a great song, I think. I'm fond of it because it's GNS, but I don't think it is particularly strong. Musically, I gave it a 12. I think it's fine, but I don't think it's as good as Sullivan's average. It's got a nice strong intro. I'll probably judge this again when I discuss the openings of Act Two, so maybe it'll do better as an opening. I'm going to judge it in both categories, but I, I, I just don't find it musically interesting. I'd say, along with When Britain Really Ruled the Waves, it's one of my most boring songs to listen to. When I was listening, I think I had it third from bottom at one point when I was listening, and Whenever it was about to come, I was like, oh, God, I don't want to listen to this song again. Does anyone actually, does anyone, like, search within your hearts, does anyone truly enjoy listening to this song? Maybe you have a particular favourite performer that you've seen done it. Like, tell me about that. Because even my beautiful, wonderful Private Willis, who I loved, I loved him. He did it great. He couldn't have done it any better than that. I think he was choking on McDonald's when he was singing it, but he did a great job. But still, it's just, it's not an engaging song. And there's not much you can do with it as a director because, and I gave it a 13 for lyrics, which also comes into what I'm talking about. There's only really one joke and it takes ages to say it. And then it's just the same joke again. And it isn't even the kind of joke that's, ah! <laughs> it's the kind of joke that's, ah, it's clever. It's that kind of joke. And to me, so I gave it a 13 for lyrics. Emotional comedic sakes, a 12. I mean, honestly, it's not, it's not even slightly emotional. It's kind of vaguely clever. Like that one joke is kind of clever, but it is not laugh out loud funny. I feel like when people laugh out loud at that, it's like performative laughing. I mean, I don't want to put laughs in people's mouths or intentions in people's laughs. Tell me if you, like, please contradict me if you have seen this and legitimately laughed out loud because of how funny it is. But I, I, I just don't see it. Six out of ten for narrative character importance. Six is a mark I give when it's certainly not obstructing the narrative. And if anything, it, you know, it helps set the scene a bit, but it doesn't really progress the story. We're not learning anything new about what's going on. It's a scene setter and it does that fine. So I gave it a six and I also gave it a six for enjoyment because I respect the fact that other people do seem to like Private Willis a lot and they do like this song. And, and it is a joke. There is a joke in there. And I get that it is vaguely enjoyable for that reason, but I'm not surprised this came bottom. I think at one point the one above it came bottom, 
but after having listened to them I really do enjoy the second from bottom a bit more than this one this one really is bottom for me even though it still got a 49 out of 80 so it didn't get below half marks which means that it is perfectly fine no beef here Number 13, I have given to a song from the Gondoliers, which sadly I'm going to cut when I do it next week slash tomorrow. Simply because the theatre needs us out by 10.30 and this was a number I felt we could do with the least in the show, which is There Lived a King, As I've Been Told, Don Al's second act song. And I want to start off by saying this got a 50 out of 80. I do like the tune. I think it's a catchy tune. I gave it a 13. I don't think it deserves any more than that. Because even though it's catchy and it's like a fun tune, I do find there's a slight disconnect between what the music is and what the words are. Um, when Giuseppe and Marco repeat Donal, I find that, well, first of all, I think it's a bit lazy that it's just like in unison and it's a very simple repeat, which is actually quite similar to Donnell's other song, which did a little bit better than this one for reasons I will later describe. But I find that, that with Toddy must be content with Toddy. Because that to me sounds nautical. It sounds like a hornpipe. And then when they repeat later, they do say admirals and this more <laughs> I'm so tired but there's more like nautical music that's like added on top of something which already to me sounds quite nautical do you guys know what I'm talking about and I don't really get why Sullivan chose to make that choice it seems a bit strange to me and it's a fine tune I, I don't mind it I actually think it's quite catchy it's way more interesting than when all that long a chap remains but I, I do find the music a bit confusing just because I don't really get where Sullivan is going I, I don't really get why that is in the toddy response as well as the admiral response I, I, I don't understand I mean I doubt I could have done any better, but I just don't get it. <laughs> ah. I need to get out my Bradley and have a look at these words. To Rachel, a wonderful star with every good wish for the future, which I hope will be filled with GNS, Ian Bradley. <laughs> oh, Ian Bradley, how little he knew that I'd be dedicating a year of my life to making videos on this subject. Okay, so the lyrics I gave, I actually gave a 15 to the lyrics. I think the lyrics are pretty cool. The only thing is that they don't really have much meaning. And I do, as an audience member, and again, remember my um, undiagnosed ADHD, which I do find it really hard to like focus and concentrate on certain things sometimes. And I, this is one of those songs which like, even though I'm listening, like I'm straining my ears every time I hear this song, I can never like really get the meaning of it. Even even though I directed it last summer, I still can't really remember what this song is about. Like I know it's about a king who tried to be friends with his subjects and it kind of didn't work out, but I don't really think the story is well told because I don't really remember like the points of the story. There's a lot of like description in there, but not much like this happened, then this happened. Um, there lived a king, as I've been told, in a wonder working days of old, when hearts were twice as good as gold and 20 times as mellow. See, he's not said anything yet as a king. Good temper triumphed in his face and in his heart he found a place for all the erring human race and every wretched fellow. So he was nice. OK. When he had Rhenish wine to drink, it made him very sad to think that some at Junket or at Jink must be content with Toddy. So he, he wanted everyone to be equal. He wished all men as rich as he, and he was rich as rich could be, so to the top of every tree, promoted to everybody. Lord Chancellors were cheap as sprats, and bishops in their shovel hats were plentiful as happy cats, and point effect too many. Ambassadors cropped up like hay, prominences as such as they grew like asparagus in May, and dukes were three a penny. See, I love this poetry. I think it's really clever. That's why I gave it a 15, because I, I even know I, I don't really think much of the story, I do like the poetry. 
On every side field marshal's gleam, small beer were lords lieutenant deemed, with admirals the ocean teemed all round his wide dominions. And but so there's a lot of descriptions, right? And party leaders you might meet in twos and threes in every street, maintaining with no little heat their various opinions. That king, although no one denies his heart was of abnormal size, yet he'd have acted otherwise if he had been acuter. The end is easily foretold when every blessed thing you hold is made of silver or of gold you long for simple pewter. When you have nothing else to wear, wear but gold, like, again, it's just more descriptions, but cloth of gold and satin's rare for cloth of gold you cease to care, up goes the price of shoddy. In short, whoever you may be to this conclusion, you'll agree. When everyone is somebody, then no one's anybody. I love the spelling of somebody, by the way. I don't know if you can see that. Somebody. <laughs> so, yeah, I get the story, but the story being told is not being told in a way that's kind of narratively clear. And it's also not a really at all relevant to the overall story because Marco and Giuseppe never learn this lesson. This is basically just Gilbert telling us that like socialism is silly. I don't know. Uh, I mean, maybe not socialism because socialism isn't quite everyone's equal. That's communism, isn't it? Because I think Gilbert is kind of socialist or he's way more socialist than a lot of people going by a song that we're literally going to be discussing later on in this video. But I don't really get what the point of this song is. What point is Gilbert making? When everybody's somebody, then no one's anybody. But w w what does that mean? Like, I mean, don't, don't tell me what it means because I know what it's meant to mean. I'm just kind of trying to grasp the <sighs> wider philosophical point here. And I don't really quite understand what place this has in the narrative. It only seems to be there to like shame Marco and Giuseppe and shame anyone that thinks that equality is good. Because this is obviously stupid and Gilbert would have known this is stupid. So who's being made fun of here? I, I, I just don't really get it. I don't find it important. I gave it 11 for emotional comedic sakes. I don't, it's not really funny and it's definitely not emotional. Six for narrative character importance. I did, I did like think that it's not really obstructing the story and it's like a nice little side piece for for Donnell to do. So I, I don't think it's devoid of any reason at all. I just, and I don't think it obstructs the narrative. I just find it a bit narratively confusing. And I also gave it a five for enjoyment. It's one of those songs that I really enjoyed it when my Donnell did it, but it's, it's not a song that I ever look forward to when I'm watching The Gondoliers. It's one that I go, oh yeah, this one, and just like switch off for a bit. Yeah, it, it's, it's catchy and I don't mind it. And it got, it got a 50 out of 80, but it, it's just, huh. Number 12, I have given to one which isn't really an aria, but I didn't know where else to put it though in body and in mind from the Pirates of Penzance. This is when the pirates re-enter after the big lovely duet between Frederick and Mabel. A crisis now, affairs are coming to. That was the wrong key, I think. But then the police all come on and then they do some dialogue with Mabel. So it's not really a, a song in its own right, but it does say something about the two songs below it that this one beat it, I do think. It's only because I think even though this song, I won't even bother giving the scores of it really, it's, it's not really much narratively or um, or emotionally, but there is some character in there because they, 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 are, they are explaining how they are scared, but they're still turning up. So there's potential there for comedy. And just because it's a reprise of the uh, When the Foeman Bears His Steel music, there's a chance for the audience to go, oh, it's these guys again. So I do think that this does have an impact where the other two maybe don't. So even though it's not even a real song, I actually appreciate its place and find it less confu less confusing than the two below it. I know that might seem crazy, but here we are. So I don't really want to spend too much time talking about it. I did, well, I'm, I'm not even really gonna give the scores. It only just beat the other two, not by much. Maybe it was too generous of me to make it beat the other two, but I just think there's some chance for comedy in there. Where in the like actual laugh out loud comedy, whereas in the other two there isn't any. 
but there's not even any like emotion to make up for that they're just unemotional and they try to be funny and they're not particularly whereas this one at least is pretty funny even if it's over super quick so yeah it's a good it's a good song number 11 might be a little bit of a disappointment to some people number 11 i have given to better far to live and die from the same opera the pirates of the penzance or the pirate king song one of the songs in the canon that is so iconic that it is not referred to by the first line of the song usually it's usually just referred to as the pirate king song for i am a pirate king and I do not mind this song at all. I think I think it's a lovely song and there does have to be a song there narratively. I gave it a, a pretty good narrative score. I gave it a seven for narrative slash character importance. I think it really hammers home exactly who the Pirate King is and his place in the narrative, why he is a pirate king he isn't just being a pirate because he's somehow evil it's because he he actually thinks that being a pirate is more honorable than being in society which i know daenerys agrees with i also kind of agree with yay daenerys i haven't seen daenerys all day not seen it feels like a day since i have seen daenerys hello i know ah i love daenerys so where it falls down is I only gave it a 12 for music. I I find it quite simplistic and both verses and refrains are exactly the same. Musically, I just find it one of the least imaginative of the canon. And then maybe that's why it became so successful because it's just quite a simple tune and it's catchy. But there are other tunes that are that also have iconic value which are just way better like when the foam and bears of steel is also quite a simple tune but i'd probably give that one quite a high music mark because of the way it all works together but this one is just it's just very simplistic lyrically though i do think it's pretty strong i gave it a 15 for lyrics i do really enjoy the second verse and the turn of phrases and, and the turn of phrase that gilbert uses there but many a king on a first class throne if he wants to call his crown his own must manage somehow to get through more dirty work than e'er i do i do think that is very clever and i appreciate the message in this song so i do think lyrically and narratively it is good it's more just it's a difficult song to direct it's a, it's difficult to know how to place this and what people are feeling about what they're saying it's difficult to direct the king in the verses because often a sentence is split up by a bit of instrumental where he has to do something while men near king on a first class room if he wants to call his crown here's a and it's just it's very difficult as a director to try and have the actor like maintain the intention of their thought throughout that phrase when the phrase is broken up with music like that and it's almost as if it's like Sullivan when Sullivan writes music it seems to me like he wants you to use that music somehow that, that like the music represents like a thought or a movement not always because I do think having watched myself ironically in the video that I'm posting today my New York adventure I do think that one of my weaknesses as a performer is that I tend to shy away from stillness and I think I maybe over move and that's why it's good for me to watch myself but um so I am aware that that is maybe something that I tend to do more than I should but as a director I think I get it better than I do when performing myself because the thing is lest we forget i do have tourette syndrome i do weird things with my body <laughs> so i can have, have the compulsion to do a thing on a beat so that's not really an act of choice it's more just an instinct it's like a compulsion really as a director i don't really have the same instincts but m my compulsion is that when there's like music like that i feel like something needs to be done with it but the king's in the middle of a thought like he's saying beautiful poetry which is being so like i this is one of those ones where I think Gilbert had quite a good thing and Sullivan maybe dropped the ball. 
And that's not something I usually say. Usually I think it's the other way around. But for me, I do think Sullivan slightly dropped the ball here. I think he made it very hard for the actor to actually sing this song with any kind of real artistic intention. And it's a horrendous song to direct. What on earth do you do with this song? I've really struggled with this one as a director. I mean, that whole first section with the pirates, I find horrible. I hate directing that. I never know what to do with that bit. And, you know, I'll keep on direct pirates, I'm sure, many, many, many more times before I die. And maybe one day I'll hit on the right way to do it. But I find this, the, the, there's such a long intro where what do you do? Go, ah, run around with swords. Like, what do you do? It, what does that music mean? What are these people feeling? I, it, it's, it's, I don't like it, really, as a director, this song. I think it's lyrically good and I appreciate its existence, but I do think that Sullivan made it really hard. And I hope you all agree with me. And if you don't, or if you have any advice for me, like, tell me, tell me what you think that music represents for the characters. Tell me, like, if you've played the Pirate King, like, what are you thinking? in that moment like what does that introduction mean to you because generally i'm not a person that i mean any of you who have seen my shows or work for me knows that i have no trouble whatsoever filling introduction music but for some reason this one really eludes me and i don't know why that is number 10 i have given to a song which is often cut called A Laughing Boy But Yesterday from The Yeoman of the Guard. I have a very, very funny story about this song. So, when we initially cast Phoebe in Our Yeoman of the Guard that happened in 2021, we actually cast it in 2019. So we cast it two years before we did it. And Will, who you know, was going to conduct it in Harrogate and Buxton, which he did. But then he usually plays a part in a, in the show that we do at another location. So he was like, okay, I'm going to play Sergeant Merrill in that. And then he had an idea. He thought, I'm not going to tell Izzy about this cut song, but I'm just going to do it. Because we didn't do this song in Buxton Harrogate, but Will said... We won't even tell Izzy we're doing it. We're just going to play the introduction and then she'll just be surprised. <laughs> this was a secret we kept for two years. Izzy is just so great and such a pro that we knew it wouldn't even throw her one bit and she'd just find it really funny. And this is evidence for that. So here is the moment when Izzy realised <laughs> that there was a song. He's a brave fellow. And bravest among brave fellows. And yet, it seems but yesterday that he robbed the lieutenant's fortune. A laughing boy, but yesterday, a merry urchin, blight and gay, whose joyous hours came reading out, unchecked by hair and sorrow. Hey, the boy, you're all so proud, whose deeds are shown to be renowned. Are all the boast of London town this song and I ranked it really high musically. I gave it a 17 out of 20. So this is one that um, I couldn't really sing for you right now offhand, but I listened to it about four times four weeks ago and twice today. But I don't think it goes like, da, 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 da. But I do, listening to it in context with all the other songs, I did think this deserved to rank really highly. I think I gave three of them 17 and one of them 19. So it's one of the best musically in this list, I think. But I, I love the twists and turns that this song makes. I know that each verse, I don't know if each verse was different, but there's definitely a change throughout the piece. It isn't just verse, refrain, verse, refrain. It actually does move through twists and turns. A little like a last time over to and fro, maybe not quite to that extent, but it isn't 
it isn't it hasn't got a simple format it is one that's very musically interesting and i i think it's a very sweet song i i gave it a 14 for its lyrics which i think is you know gilbert's average mark for a perfectly fine song a laughing boy but yesterday a merry urchin blithe and gay whose joyous shout came ringing out unchecked by care or sorrow it's just nice it's good poetry i think the only reason i didn't give it higher than a 14 is just because it's not particularly meaningful. It's not, he's not a person we connect with, you know? It's not a meaningful or interesting story. Today a warrior or sun brown whose deeds are solid, uh, sold, soldierly, soldiery. <laughs> How do you even say that, Renown? All the boasts of London town, a veteran. Tomorrow, that reminds me of Julia Zara. When at my Lena's deeds sublime, a soldier's pulse beats double time, and brave hearts thrill as brave hearts will at tales of martial glory. I burn with flush of pride and joy, a pride unbittered by alloy, to find my boy, my darling boy, the theme of song and story. So while I think the poetry is good, it's just a bit meaningless, really. I mean, we we don't care about Leonard Merrill or who he is. I mean, I guess the fact that he's a brave and respected soldier is relevant to the story, but we just don't need this <laughs> at all, really. I gave it a five for narrative character importance. I don't think it impedes the narrative, but it does slow it down. It's certainly not something we need. 12 for emotional slash comedic stakes. I think it's I, I did give it a 12 because I do think it's nice for us to see Sergeant Merrill in this like fatherly place but we also see him like that with Phoebe so again it's just unnecessary a five for enjoyment too it's not one that if I hear those in that, that, dun, ba, dun, that introduction I don't go like oh yes I go like oh, okay they're doing this one like it's not one that I particularly care about hearing but you know if people want to include it fine and I welcome its inclusion but I probably, personally, would not go out of my way to include it unless the person playing Meryl like, really wanted it. But yeah, I, I, I don't hate it. I gave it a 53 out of 80. It's just not a showstopper. But I do think it is better than the ones below it. Number nine, I have given to a song from Patience. When I first put this uniform... On. Now, remember in my base characters video, oh, the Colonel's great, he's such a fun character, but his two songs I don't think are the most interesting songs. I do like it, I'm just going to find it so I can look at it lyrically, but again it's not one that I remember that well, it doesn't stick in my mind. As one, oh yeah, that's the words. Um, when I first put this uniform on, I said as I looked in the glass, it's one in a million that any civilian might figure and form something. But okay, I don't know the words. Hold on. It's one to a million that any civilian my figure and form will surpass. God lays us. It's a, it, it's it's nice poetry, as there is in all of patience, which is why I gave it a sixteen. I did give it, it, it a sixteen for lyrics because I do think the poetry is really good. God lace has a charm for the fair, and I have plenty of that and to spare, while a lover's professions, when uttered in Hessians, are eloquent everywhere. It's nice. By a simple coincidence, few could ever have counted upon. The same thing occurred to me when I put this when I first put this uniform on. And the thing is, even though it's not hugely funny, I did give it like a relatively kind of decent mark of twelve, purely because. I just love it when the guys say, I didn't anticipate that when I first put this uniform on. Because I don't think this is a laugh out loud funny song. It's kind of like, it's quaint. It's, like, oh. it's relatively amusing, but I, can't, I couldn't give it more than a 12. I really couldn't. And it's not really emotional. I mean, I guess they're, they're sad, but it's not like the kind of sadness that you properly connect with, at least not at this stage. But the peripatetics of long haired aesthetics are very much more to their taste. See, lyrically, it is superb. And I also gave it a 15 for music. It is wonderfully militaristic. Bum, 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 ba da ba da ba dum, bum, ba da lam, bum, bum, ba. And they've got a really awesome exit where they often kind of go, ah, da, ba, 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 and go out. And it's a, it's a great, it's a really rousing song that's got great lyrics. It's just not particularly meaningful emotionally. And it's it's a bridge to get us from the big group scene with Bunthorn to the scene with Bunthorn on his own. It's just, it's a bridge between those two sections and it does its job well. 
I'd never dream of cutting it, but it's just not like narratively spectacular. I gave it, I gave it a six for narrative character importance. And is this important to the Colonel's character? I mean, if it was cut, you'd think the same of him. I don't think you'd lose anything, but you would lose a certain kind of feeling of like the narrative arc of the piece. I do think that there needs to be a song like that in this place. So I do think it is narratively well placed, but it's just not particularly meaningful to the story. And you know, I, I enjoy it fine. I have a five for enjoyment. It's just one of my least kind of, ooh, I love this song from Patient, to be honest. I feel like I have more energy now than I did at the start of this video. Uh, I feel like I've actually got a shot at finishing this video tonight and then I can edit it over the course of the week. Because I've also got, I've got Joanna coming round on Tuesday and guess what we're filming. We are filming the Act 1 finales ranking video. So I've already scored them. And oh my God, I haven't thought so much about a list yet. Like, I thought so carefully about that one. I know she's doing the same. So I can't wait for that one because Act 1 finales, I mean, that's, those, that's the huge climax of these operas. And yeah, I can't wait about that. That's going to be great. So that will come either the week after this one or two weeks after this one, depending if I manage to slide another one in between. <laughs> we shall see. Number eight I have given to I'm Captain Corker in KCB from Utopia Limited. And why have you put one that is not a really a bass aria and that is from quite a not well thought of opera so high up this list? I hear you scream in disgust at me. Oh, that was a fly on me. Maybe that was a fly on me. <laughs> Horrible. I will tell you exactly why. So, who here, who has seen a production of Utopia Limited? Like, try and tell me that this is not one of the most iconic moments of the show. And just think, think back. Like, imagine if you didn't know it was coming. I um, imagine that you didn't know that was going to happen and you were sitting there 1893 in the Savoy Theatre. I hope I'm right that it was a Savoy Theatre. I'm sure it was. And you see this guy come on stage and suddenly the sailor music comes on and he says, I'm Captain Corker in KCB. What? That was a character from HMS Binnable. Think how people just lose their minds today when things self, when artists like self-reference themselves in like other areas of their work. Like how cool is that? And that is like such a modern idea. Like, I mean, is that a modern idea? Maybe I'm doing that thing where you think something's really modern, but it's actually been happening forever. Like how people think the name Tiffany is really modern, but it's actually really, really old. There's a name for it. I think it's actually called like the Tiffany effect or something. Anyway, tired. I just, it, to me, I feel like that would have just completely blown people's minds. And it still does today. Like whenever I've been in or like seen, I've actually never seen a live Utopia Limited ever. That's, I've never seen, I've been in two, but I've never seen it live. I've watched DVDs. But like whenever I've watched a DVD or been in Utopia, people always just go absolutely nuts when that happens. It is hilarious. And I know that a lot of the hilarity comes at the end of it with the what never, oh never. But I do kind of include that within the aria because it's he's still the main focus. And then like the chorus singing, they give three cheers and three cheers for they never as a ship or you know, um whatever the words are. And the atmosphere is always electric. People love this bit, and people just go nuts over it. I gave this an eight for enjoyment for that reason, because people do love this moment. It is one of the most iconic and like people sitting up in their seats moments in the show. And that just cannot be denied. You can't deny how iconic this moment is. It's also really fun musically. I gave it a 15 for music. It's such a, it's a jaunty tune. As I said in my bass characters video, it's such a groove. We never run a ship but sure. And then it seamlessly transitions into the HS into the HMS, <laughs> into the HMS Pinnacle music. Oh, help. 
and the opening and terrify the simple Gaul. And how the Saxons and the Celts. It's just so fun. It's like, it, it gives you like a ooh. I mean, I don't know if anyone just, I just love the sound of bass voices. And this is like a proper true bass moment. And I'm just here for it. I absolutely love it. And emotional comedic sakes, I gave this a 14. I, again, I don't think it's like truly laugh out loud funny until you get to the like what and never. But then actually having said that though, as soon as this is Captain Corcoran, I think people will just laugh at that because it's just funny that Gilbert's referring to his past shows. It's, it's fun. It's, it's just so, it's kind of self-deprecating in a way, but it's, it's just lovely. I just love the fact that he's used in it. So this song has only ranked, so has ranked highly a lot just because of its existence and not because of the actual content of the song. But I hope people agree that this is the correct place for him. And honestly, I just think that overall it is just more enjoyable, more iconic and actually musically really good. I, just, I do think it genuinely beats the others below it. Let me know if you disagree. Number seven, I have given to another song which is only loosely an aria. It's got chorus responses in it, but yeah, it's, it's odd to think of it as an aria. This Helmet, I suppose, from Princess Ida. Now, though this one is simple musically, I think it's actually deceptively simple or deceptively complicated. You know what I mean, as in, I think a lot more thought went into it than maybe I might appreciate. I love the baroqueness of it and I especially find it's like a lobster shell. <laughs> For some reason I find that hilarious and maybe somebody can explain to me why it is that I find that so funny. I like the fact that just that verse three is in a different key to the others and the chorus sing the response in unison and it's about a lobster shell. The thing about the combination of those three things which makes me laugh. I did give it a 15 for emotional comedic stakes because just the idea of this guy like stopping this very high stakes situation to sing a song about taking his armour off. Like, yeah, it is a bit narratively clunky, but it's not actively in the way. So I, get, I gave it a five for that. But I think that this is just one of those songs that people do just love. I gave it an eight for enjoyment. And the fact that he's just stopped to sing it is so silly and funny. But, you know, it's not ranked really, really high in any category. I gave it a 13 for lyrics. I think that the lyrics are particularly clever. As I say, I like the fact that the lobster shell is mentioned, but it's more the musical ornamentation on the word shell that I find funnier than the fact that it's a lobster that's mentioned, if that makes sense. This tide-fitting cuirass is but a useless mass. It's, it, yeah, it, it, these rhymes are not anything to like particularly write home about, but I, yeah, did, did, I did give a, a 13 for lyrics. Yeah, that's a 17 for music. I, the music, I think, is really lovely. Yes, 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 so off that helmet goes. That actually may be the right key. I said, it's funny that when it comes to GNS, I do kind of have almost perfect pitch just because I know them so well and I just know where they kind of sit. But also Arak, I mean, what a character. Arak, Gurren and Cynthia's, especially in the Brent Walker video, they, they just kill it. They are so funny. If you haven't seen the Brent Walker Princess Ida, you, you have to, because honestly, there are some amazing performances in that, in that video, especially the three brothers, Arak, Gurren and Cynthia's. They are all so good. They're such an amazing team. And they're just all so funny. And they just properly get why it's funny as well. And I just, I love it. Because some of those videos are properly weak. Like the HRS Pinafore is not good. It, it, it's, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. Like, I remember watching the Nevermind a Wide Wherefore for some inspiration. I just, it was so lacklustre. And there were mistakes, there were like so many mistakes and like takes that they didn't bother to do again, even though things went obviously wrong. Anyway, I'm digressing. What's the Brent Walker Princess Ida? It's it's so, so good. Like just for Arak, Gurren and Cynthia's alone, it's worth it for them. But as I said in my base characters video, Arak is such a great character. It's kind of a shame that his 
other two songs I've really classed as trios. So it means he doesn't really get the credit for how great the music is, but it's also nice that they're considered as a three. But this is a really fun song. The only reason it hasn't come higher is just because of its weakness narratively and emotionally, and the fact that it's not screamingly funny. It's just, it's got a lot of comedic potential, certainly, but it's not as kind of witty or clever as I think some of the other ones. But having said that, I love it. I, I give it eight for enjoyment. I think this is one of the songs that people really love to hear. They really look forward to. Act three of Princess Ida isn't the strongest when considering how strong act one and two are. So this is a lovely kind of pick me up before we go into the home straight of the opera. Number six is another piece from The Gondoliers. I Stole the Prince, which is Donnell's first act aria. Now, this is a song which I tended to think before directing Gondoliers, that Donnell's two songs were some of the weakest songs in the entire canon. But then having thought about that a great deal after I directed it, I do think this song is quite a bit stronger than the second one. Mainly because it's so strong narratively. There is so much narrative, there's so much story explained in this song. And actually, if you this is one of the instances, I actually gave it a 10 for now to slash character importance because if this song was cut and no dialogue put in its place, we'd be missing like a huge chunk of the story. Like he tells people a lot here and he tells it in a way that is engaging. So even though the music isn't amazing, I only gave it a 13 for music. So it's, it's not horrible and it's quite catchy. It's more, this low mark is more the fact that the responses given by the quartet are just very vanilla. No possible doubt, whatever. And, it, and they're all in unison. They're, they're, they're not even in harmony at the end. My cat is, has been trying to catch a fly for the last like 10 minutes. So if you can hear buzzing, that's what that is. I think she's got it. Good girl, Kitty, you get that fly. I think she's eating it. Uh. I gave it a 16 for lyrics. I think that lyrically it's a fun song and it's a, it's a silly fun song. And it gives Don Al the opportunity to be funny and emotional in a funny way. I don't think he's truly sad about the fact that, that this guy has died. You know, if I dropped a grand inquisitor's tear. As long as they've got a good connection with the conductor, I think there's a lot of chances for like tempo changes to kind of make the song a little bit more vibrant and interesting. There's just a lot you can do with it. And some of the imagery is really powerful as well. When he mentions the gout that has doubled him up forever, it's just, it's the fact that the story is made more interesting with some of these little details and is made more vivid as opposed to overloading us with detail which he does in the second act aria, which actually makes it less comprehensible. But in this case, the little details that Gilbert adds that Don Al sings makes the story actually a bit more engaging and a bit more picturable, a bit more accessible. <laughs> Both of the babes were strong and stout and considering all things clever. <laughs> It's just a lovely turn of phrase. In a similar way to how he kind of plays around with formal logic in Princess Ida, it is interesting how what he's saying is very true. Like, of that there is no doubt, whatever. And that's like a running joke throughout it, which is something that is not quite laugh out loud funny, but it's funny enough for me to give a 14 out of 20. His terrible taste for tippling, lovely alliteration there could never declare with a mind sincere which of the two of his was his offspring dear and which the royal stripling. <laughs> it's just, I, uh, it's, it's just lovely. The children followed his old career, this statement can't be parried, of a highly respectable gondolier, well, one of the two who will soon be here, but which of the two is not quite clear is the royal prince you married. There's something very satisfying about the way those rhymes resolve themselves, even if the lyrics aren't like expert level, you know, I gave it a 16, not anything higher. I do enjoy the way it scans. There's comic potential in it. It's musically fine, narratively excellent. 
And although I don't think it's one that particularly audiences look forward to, I gave it a six because I think if you've got a really cracking Donnell, this can just be an amazing song. And this, as I mentioned in an earlier video, was actually probably the best received song when we did Gondoliers and Bucks in the first time. It got like a woo, it got a proper cheer after Rowley sang it. Like The audience loved it. And yeah, that is down to him, but he also was given the platform by how the song was written in order to be that funny. So the song did give him that opportunity to be funny. So yeah, I, I do not, after much consideration, I don't think this is a bad song at all. Even though it's got the reputation of being a bit boring, I think it's great. It's a really great song and I'm looking forward to hearing it again in a week's time. When you're watching this, it'll be tomorrow. So maybe it'll be sold out by then. The, the link's still in the description. Yeah. Number five, I have given to another song, which is Often Cut. Often Cut. Which is Fold Your Flapping Wings from Iolanthe. And this is a song that I love. I will always put it in when I do Iolanthe because I think that the message behind this song is a really important one. And I think it's also, not only is the message important, but I think the fact that Gilbert was imparting this message is also really important. So Gilbert has this reputation as being a person who didn't really put too much thought into things. I know it's just topsy-turvy, don't think too deeply about it, but I think that's actually doing him a disservice. I think Gilbert thought very deeply about a lot of things he was saying. And this, the fact that he wrote this song to me is evidence of his quite socialist feelings. And to say somebody is a socialist is very different to saying somebody might have some socialist inclinations. Like remember, the NHS is a socialist institution. Like I think people tend to have this knee-jerk reaction to socialism where they think, oh God, it's all, that would be a nightmare. And it's like, well, no, no, it's just, you can still have socialist laws or like socialists, or like socialist institutions without the country itself being socialist. But this song to me is socialism. Take a tipsy lout gathered from the gutter, hustle him about strap into a shutter. What am I but he, washed at our stated, fed on filigree, clothed and educated? He's a mark of scorn, I, I might be another, if I had been born of a tipsy mother. Take a wretched thief through the city sneaking, pocket handkerchief ever, ever seeking. What is he but I, robbed of all my chances, picking pockets by force of circumstances? I might be as bad as unlucky, rather, if I'd only had Fagin for a father. Just think about what that means. Like, after he wrote an opera about how people should be sticking to their social classes or you know that is the opinion of a lot of the actors that a lot of the characters in HMS Pinafore and think how much he was making fun of like how ridiculous that is and then think of this he is actively saying that we are the same and the only reason that some people turn out to be criminals is because of circumstances at risk of stating the obvious, of course, there are plenty of criminals who have been born into good circumstances, but a lot of criminality is just born of desperation. And Gilbert knew this. And to me, that's quite advanced and very forward thinking of him. And that's like the reason I always love to include it, because the message is so good. I think lyrically, it's excellent. I gave it a 17 for lyrics, just because not necessarily of the poetry, but just how meaningful it is and how important this message is. I also gave it a 16 for music because it's so sinister. Du, 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 du. I might have got this interval slightly wrong, but you know what I mean. That's a sinister. Then, what is he but I? Robbed of all my chances. The way that that mood switch happens, I think it's very skillful. I absolutely love the music in this song. Maybe not quite as much as A Laughing Boy, but yesterday, I think there's something really special about that one. But this, I think, is really excellent. 
So musically great, lyrically great. And I also gave it a 16 for emotional slash comedic stakes, where it falls down as narrative slash character importance. I only gave it a four because as good as this song is, and you know, I gave it a seven for enjoyment as well. As good as this song is, it does somewhat obstruct the narrative. Not because you don't, not because it's not like relevant to the situation. Because I mean, I guess it's it's relevant. It could be relevant to Streffen's arc, and he can use that in his character development. But it's more just when you think of the structure of Act Two itself. There's just all these emotional ups and downs, and this how this is placed with the Phyllis scene following it just doesn't seem quite right to me because we've just had if you go in then as a big downer and then there's no real transition into this really funny in this to, into this comedic scene with him and Phyllis it's like you you don't really feel like laughing after that really emotional song and then suddenly you you have to find what they're saying funny so thought, it's an awkward transition after the nightmare song which is also quite dark it's quite a gentle move into comedy and Mount Tara deliberately changes the mood with that speech in like a very sweet and charming way but we don't really get that same kind of transition with the Phyllis and Streffen scene so the narrative issues aren't really an issue with the song itself it's more just the fact that as great as it is it just doesn't really go anywhere in the opera like it doesn't fit anywhere nicely I don't really know where you'd put it and the thing is I will always include it because I love it so much but I do admit that it does make Streffen and Phyllis's job in that following scene a little bit more difficult and that is something that you know again maybe people can give me some advice on how they dealt with that when they used it but yeah it is a concern and that's maybe why it's not come higher but it still did very well fifth place very good number four i have given to a very much loved song from the pirates of penzance when a felon's not engaged in his employment which i happen to think is much more interesting and engaging than the pirate king song in the first act i only gave it a 13 for music I do not think the music is that sophisticated, but it is perfectly serviceable for what it is. I gave it a 15 for lyrics. While I do think that um, some of the repeats are a bit silly and simplistic, that is also the charm of it and the pied in crime. I mean, come on, that's great. I love it. So it's one of those ones that is good because it's quite simple and because it's it sounds a bit lazy the way it's structured but it's actually really funny there's something very very charming and iconic about it and there's a reason why this one i think has lasted so long but i just think it's so much more charming and engaging than the pirate king song i gave it a 17 for emotional slash comedic stakes because it is just so funny there is so much chance for the policeman to be comedic here, to do funny gestures or just to do a funny dance. There's just scope to do kind of funny like country dancing or any kind of dancing that you would like to do. It's just it's just a gift of an intro and an outro, in my opinion. Yes, Kitty, that's right. Oh, you're going to stand behind me. What I like about the sergeant and his men is that they're actually in this really terrifying situation but they're trying to be brave and they're kind of quite sad about their jobs and the song like seems like a sad song but it's like oddly jaunty and i think that just adds to the comedy that just adds to the comedy of it and so i i think for for, for that reason i really appreciate this song it's very gns -y. it's very topsy-turvy because the tone of the music is very much at odds with what with the actual topic of the song because the topic of the song is it's actually really hard to be a police officer because we're having to arrest these people which were which we should have compassion for and you know lest we forget like people were still being like executed <laughs> in those days you know not publicly but like people were still being I actually went to an exhibition about executions. I got this book um, about public executions in London. Um, so they, they stopped doing public executions. But they were still very much doing executions at this time. And it's like kind of harrowing to think like what these 
police officers will have been through when the cutthroat isn't occupied in crime. You know, he likes to listen to the finished choice. It's so stupid. If you actually stop to think about these lyrics, they really are ridiculous. But this one really, it truly has iconic status. And I think it's enjoyable in a way the Pirate King song is not. I gave it an eight for enjoyment. I also gave it an eight for narrative slash character importance because I think understanding, like getting into these people's minds, especially the sergeant, I think that is actually quite integral to the story. And it's a lovely narrative bridge between that very serious duet that had that quite funny ending and Cat Like Tread. It's the absolute perfect tone just to bridge those two things together this is why like even if i don't speak it sounds like maybe i don't speak very highly of the pirates of penzance i do think its strength the strength of the pirates of penzance is just the the tonal structure of it it's just everything is placed so well in terms like emotionally Maybe the first bit is a little bit messy because that's just all exposition, but then the, the the emotions throughout the second act are just perfect. When you think about, there's like a gentle introduction and then you get to see the girls worried about their father. Then you get this rousing song with the policeman and then you, and then that energy continues. But then that energy is cut short by Ruth and the Pirate King. And then you get a conflict there and you get some tension and then that tension comes to its very climax when Mabel Anderson goes, no, but Frederick, what are you talking about? You can't do this. And then you get that really crushing, sad moment. And then they find peace and then he leaves. And then she's left on stage and a policeman come in and they have this rousing number. Then she leaves and they're like, oh, wow. So we're in the story now. And it's just, it's such a beautiful comedy moment after all this seriousness. And it, I cannot overstate it's like how well Pirates of Penzance is structured and this song just fits really well in that tonal structure and that's why I think a lot of people like the Pirates of Penzance it's not really the characters it's more just the narrative it's more just how it feels to be in the audience for that show it's just a great piece of theatre number three and this one did switch with number two i was struggling between these two thinking oh which one really is the best what which one in my heart do i really believe is the best and this it this was a really tough choice for me because i like these i like number three and number two both for very very different reasons and i think just on balance of historically how well people tend to do this one I do think that this one I'm about to talk about I've seen done badly more than the one above it so I think it is harder to do this at its best and so for that reason number three is a more humane Mikado from the Mikado I gave it a 15 for music I do think that a lot that a lot of why I like the music actually comes in the harmonies in the chorus responses after the second and third verse. But having said that, I also love the tune. It's really catchy. The introductions of the songs in the Mikado are just so good. And this this is no exception. This one. I've got a great introduction. I can't believe that Gilbert almost cut this song. It's it's, it's criminal. Ah, the criminal crime. But it's to me, it's criminal that he almost cut this. I guess he just lost confidence in it. And I suppose the fact that it seems kind of similar in tone to the Little List song. But having thought about this more recently since watching Mikado again, I actually prefer this song. I think to the Little List song. Like if I was going to cut one, I'd probably cut the Little List song. To be honest, over this one, even I I wouldn't cut the Little List. I might just move it to where it originally was. I gave it a 16 for lyrics. Even though I think this song was probably like a 20 in lyrics at the time when it was made, but the sad thing is the lyrics haven't really aged very well. And a lot of the things that they're talking about aren't really that meaningful today. So I think that maybe Gilbert could have thought a bit more about using very current references because most of Gilbert's lyrics have aged extremely well, but just this one, a lot of it just isn't funny because we don't really understand the references. And as much as you can say, oh, well, people should research the references. Well, yeah, maybe, but isn't something funnier when it's understandable by everyone? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. 
all prosy dull society sinners who chatter and bleat and bore. Like, I don't know what society sinners are. Like people who are kind of out, uh, like not in society, who, I, I don't know, well, I don't know what that means. Are sent to hear sermons from mystical Germans who preach from 10 till 4. I love the poetry, no idea what he's talking about. The amateur tenor whose vocal villainy is all desire to shirk shall, during off hours, exhibit his powers to Madame Tussauds waxwork. Great. Love that. That's funny. The lady who dyes a chemical yellow or stains her grey hair piece or pinches her figure is painted with vigour and permanent walnut juice. I know those weren't the original lyrics and I'm very glad they were changed, but sadly it's kind of obvious that they were changed because it doesn't really make too much sense. The idiot who in railroad carriage scribbles on window panes, we only suffer to rise on a buffer in parliamentary trains. Hey, I know what a parliamentary train is. And the thing is, I didn't know this because I like researched the Mikado. I know this because I follow this guy who I, can't, I think it's, I think it's Jeff Marshall. I follow this guy on YouTube who um, talks about trains and he goes to these stations that aren't used he goes to like the least used stations in the country there's another guy that does it as well i can't remember his name but i really love jeff marshall and uh he went to this one station which only has one train a week going to it and it's called a parliamentary train so it's basically a train that the government just pays to keep running for like government reasons and i don't really understand like why that happens i guess it's so the station can stay open for like law i don't know i don't know why I, i'll see what bradley says about it oh yeah because i guess for the train company to keep operating it needs to like show that it stopped at all these stations for some reason they have to run at least one train a day on all lines which stopped at every station with a fare of one penny a mile these came to known as parliamentary trains so maybe like for a tr for a company to keep running it has to show that it stops at say this one station at least like one time a week but that's that's what i really don't know what parliamentary trains are i thought i did when i started this long spiel about it i kind of get it it's like trains that don't really serve any passengers and they're only really running to like serve some kind of law or to like keep the government or the companies happy you know it's something like that the advertising quack who wearies with tales of countless cures, his teeth I've enacted shall all be extracted by terrified amateurs. <laughs> I love that! That's so good! <laughs> and So, I love the imagery in this song, and I do think the lyrics are very funny, but I only gave it a 16, not higher, just because some of them haven't aged very well. What I love most about this song, though, is the scope that it gives the Mikado to be absolutely deranged. And I love, I don't know if I'm going to say his name right, John Alden, John Alden. You know who I'm talking about, you can correct my pronunciation, my pronunciation, my pronunciation in the comments. But his Mikado is, uh, oh my god, I absolutely love his Mikado. It's so unhinged. And I think that maybe a few years ago I would have thought that it was too much, but I have totally changed my mind now. I think his characterization of the Mikado is absolutely perfect. It's a... <laughs> my object of supply is just completely deranged. And the fact that like this guy is like the emperor of Japan, he's like a dictator. And everyone behind him is like, they have to pretend like everything he's doing is totally normal. But this guy is completely unhinged. Like, you have, he is totally unpredictable. I'm like, oh, I'm not a bit angry. Or it's fine, you know, I'll just do your execution later. You know, he's just, oh. But I cannot get over how funny this song can be and how well it can set up the Mikado's character. So I gave it a nine for narrative slash character importance for that reason and an eight for enjoyment. Because like, yeah, well, this great song. People love this song. 15 for music, 16 for lyrics, 16 for emotional queen of stakes. So even though it's done decently, it just hasn't done like incredibly. 
but like I really love it and I think it's a very enjoyable song and I can't wait to direct the Mikado again with better names for the characters which I am coming up with and so when I do my dialogue video for the Mikado in about six weeks or so I'll be able to use those names instead of the horrible ones yay number two I have given to a piece from from I have given to a piece from Rudigal called When the Night Wind Slash Wind Howls. I never know if it's wind or wind. I have heard both. I think both are correct. I just let people do what they want to do, really. It's fine. Now, this originally came number three, but when I listened to it again today, I was like, oh, actually... God, the music is so good. And I actually gave it two more music points. I almost gave it a 20. The only reason I didn't give it a 20 is because all three verses are vocally, they're the same. You do hear differences in the orchestra, which is why I absolutely love it. That flute in the second verse, the, the, the little fluttery flute responses in the second verse, I think are so so oh, spine tingling and that's just what this piece is like it's not funny it's, it's not in the least bit funny unless you choose to make that choice as a director which is totally valid because it is just camp it's, it's so dramatic that you could definitely make this funny just by being totally over the top with it and that's a very valid choice but I, I, I gave it a 16 for emotional comedic stakes because even though it's funny because even though I don't consider it particularly moving or particularly funny it's more just that I don't have a dramatic impact category in this one so it's kind of fulfilling both of those conditions in this category really it just makes you feel something and when Roderick comes out like that should be his one job just to be such a presence like if you're gonna cast an actor with like a strong presence you want to cast him in this role here often like even though it's quite a small part like you put the person with the best voice as Roderick over Robin don't you I mean I, for me I think it's so important to have such a cracking voice in this role I don't know what you guys think but this when when you hear someone singing the first phrase of the song and they're just like a really really good uh bass variety I think oh I'm in safe hands now. this is good this is gonna be this is gonna be ah, it's gonna be great but musically I love this song lyrically the poetry is lovely the only reason I give it a 15 rather than higher is just that same problem in that it's a lovely song, but it's just not particularly meaningful. You don't, there's not really a story there. There's lovely imagery. I, lo I love the imagery of um, all the ghosts taking plight and with each ghost with this lady ho uh, with a kiss perhaps on the, there's, there's lots of things that you can visualise, which I think are tremendously powerful and really sinister and interesting, but they're not meaningful and especially not meaningful for the story i gave it a seven out of ten for narrative slash character importance i think it's good for establishing roderick as a character but not really in saying who he is but just telling you what you should feel in his presence so it's setting him up as a threat just by how powerful the music is beware beware oh it's it's it should be utterly spine tingling so even if you do make comedic choices in it oh god it has to be spine tingling it just, oh. there's just it, it should make you feel like goosebumps this song and i do absolutely love it eight out of ten for enjoyment the only reason i didn't give it more than that is because i have seen this fall a bit flat i think when it's not directed responsibly like i i have seen this where the director and the singers and the MD haven't really put too much thought into it and it's just like a okay song I mean this is never going to be bad this is one of those songs that's always going to be great because it's just a iconic song this one is never going to be bad it's like pizza isn't it it's never going to be that bad apart from this one pizza I had in Italy as well where like it was really doughy and flavorless and then the tomato paste was like burning hot and tasted of again like of nothing and the cheese tasted of nothing I think it was mozzarella cheese which can be quite bland but it just wasn't seasoned it's like that's the worst piece I've ever had in my life I still ate the whole thing you know it's, it's like it's never going to be bad but it it does have the potential to not be amazing Chris number one on this list if it is sung in exactly the way Sullivan set it and away Gull Gullivan <laughs> And the way Gilbert wrote the words, it's always going to be brilliant. And so let's move on to number one. Now, 
I cannot tell you how happy I am that I finally have a number one on a list from this opera. And it wasn't, I didn't even have to tinker slightly. This one scored 71 out of 80. When the Night Wine Howls scored 65, it, they were miles apart, like a full six marks. And this is Now Jury Men Hear My Advice from Trial by Jury. So the usher, who is the bass part from Trial by Jury, he gets a number one position on this list. And I'm so happy about that because Trial by Jury doesn't tend to do well on these lists because it just kind of lacks a bit of depth. But in this case, it doesn't really seem to matter because the comedic level is so high that it's just totally slaughtered all the other ones. 17 for music. Bum, 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 bum. Lovely intro on that bassoon. That bassoon cracks me up every time. It sounds like a duck. Love the bassoon. And the fact that every verse is different. I know I'm kind of channeling Will right now, but da 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 upon the other side. What he may say you needn't mind. From bias the the pauses in the music, the the fact that every verse is different. Oh, listen to the plaintiff's case. Observe the features of her face, a broken-hearted bride. I don't even know if I got that interval right, but I know that I love that interval, whatever it is. Broken-hearted bride. I think that's right. Someone can correct me on that. I actually, I don't actually have a trial score, so I can't check that annoyingly, but I'm sure Will will correct me immediately. Broken-hearted bride. That's what I want it to be. I think that's probably what it is. Condol with her distress of mind from bias. Uh, and when amid the plaintiff shrieks, the ruffianly defendant speaks upon the other side. I just think the, it's musically, it's so charming and so well structured. I know it's short, but I don't care. In this case, I do not care how short this song is. I think it is musically wonderful. As I say, I only gave it a 17, which ranks it on a par with Laughing Boy, and this helmet, I suppose. It didn't beat When the Night Wind Howls. That got a 19. So I do recognise it's not as musically advanced maybe as the one in Radigal, but I do absolutely love it. 18 for lyrics. As I've just said, those lyrics, they're so funny. If you delivered that completely deadpan, without any acting skill whatsoever, it's funny. If you just sing the tune and deliver the words, people are going to be laughing out loud. In fact, almost like the less acting you can do, the more funny it is. <laughs> what, what he may say, you needn't mind. From bias free of every silence and call. <laughs> and it's the fact that even though we haven't really established that, like, Gilbert and Sullivan, their thing is, like, echoing... I suppose, like, was that a thing in other operas before that? And they're kind of making fun of that? Or is that just a GNS thing? I don't know. But it's the fact they're already making fun of themselves. They're already making fun of this, of this need of the chorus to just, like, repeat everything <laughs> that, um, that the principals say. And I, I find it so, so silly and funny. From bias, please, silence, of course, silence. <laughs> It's just absolutely great. And it sets up his little motif for the rest of the show as well. Narrative character importance, I gave a 9 out of 10. This just completely sets up exactly where we are and what we're about to do. It says that we're about to listen to a case. I've never been on a jury, but I bet this is similar to a speech that the jury actually gets. So this is, it's kind of real in a way. It's real, but it's heightened and it's stupid. So narratively, it's so important to kind of set ourselves in this courtroom. And the usher is setting himself up as a person who is commanding the space. And yes, he repeats this motto of silence in court throughout the rest of the little mini opera. Um, emotional comedic stakes, I gave a 17. That's probably the highest mark I can give it, considering it's not at all emotional, but I do think it is absolutely hilarious. As I say, much like the uh, bit where the judge comes on with a let him speak, let him speak, let's let him speak. In some ways, Gilbert and Sullivan like cracked it in trial by jury and never quite got to that level again because their mixture of text and music and trial by jury it's, it's, it's set up in such a way that you can't do it badly. If he just 
say that if you just sing the material as it is written it's going to be great every time and maybe that's why I find it slightly dull because it's not really challenging for me but it's just so good in some ways you know when David Wood said Trabadori is the best one you know he's kind of right in a weird twisted way that there is something just so perfect about trial by jury but is it as deep as the others that's the thing it's not quite as deep but then some people don't really care about things being deep and that's also perfectly fine art should often be like just escapism and that's valid enjoyment i gave a 10 this is the only one i gave a 10 to but who doesn't absolutely love this piece every single time they hear it who doesn't want to play this part like i would love to play this part it's a bit low for me because uh, I can actually sing a lot of baritone parts at pitch, but this is like this is like a proper bass part, and I find this too tricky. But yeah, in conclusion, I am not at all surprised this song came number one. I kind of forgot it existed until I did my bass characters video, and that's what alerted me to how good the part of the usher is. And although Trial by Jury isn't one that I talk about a ton because it's just so short and just kind of lacks the depth and complexity of character that the others do. And the dramatic and emotional stakes it is just wonderful and this piece is just an example of the absolute height of Gilbert and Sullivan working together just to create something really unique and it is this when you think about you know after Heart the Hour of Tennis Sound you know that's the big opener but it's not that funny you know that's the big opener this would have been people's a lot of people's first sight if they hadn't seen Thespis this would have been a lot of people's first view of like, oh, this is what this is. This is who Gilbert and Sullivan are. Like, this is what they do. Now, jury men, hear my advice. Or kinds of vulgar prejudice. I pray you set aside. I pray you set aside. And they get, and they'd start to think, oh wait, he's. This is funny. This is this is really funny. Can you imagine us being in that audience and hearing that and thinking, wow, I'm I'm here seeing something completely unique and like. This one did so much better. Than, was it Le Pericole? I think that's the opera that was put after this one. But wow, what a great guy. What a great piece. Well done. So that is it for my bass arias video. Oh, I can't believe I managed to do that in an evening. I'm very happy because now I can just edit that throughout the week and I'm back on track to get one video a week to you guys. And that is nice. So... As ever, links are in the description. Remember, I am playing Lisa in The Grand Duke, probably in a week's time from this video. It's on the 7th or the 10th of June. It's in the description. Gondoliers will be tomorrow at Hever Castle. And please, if ever anyone has donations, that's really appreciated. I had to take two of my cats. I had to take all three of my cats to the vet for very expensive treatment in the last week. So if I'm able to pay myself a fee, for four bears gondoliers that would that would be very nice <laughs> so any donations even though they technically be for four bear theater it would be nice to pay myself back for all the things i've bought for the show so please do give generously if you are able if you like the work that i do and would like to see more uh i can produce better work when i'm not desperately scrambling for money so anything you can do to make my life easier will also mean that i can produce really good theater but as ever, thank you for your continued support. If you have not already subscribed to this channel, but like you're watching this video, it's like, wh why haven't you subscribed? Well, what are you scared of? Just click subscribe and I promise you nothing bad will happen. I, I promise. I guarantee. Just press subscribe and like this video. Because I also get so few likes as well. Just, just, just like the video. Just dislike it. Unless you don't like it. And then tell me what you don't like about it. If you're watching this videos but you don't like them, tell me. Tell me why. You can do it privately if you want. I won't tell anyone. Unless you're mean, then I'll post it publicly. Thank you for watching. I will see you for the next one, which might be the Act 1 Finale's one. Uh, who knows?